Welcome to Bring the World Home, a production of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Deborah Ball. I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, West Africa, from 1992 to 1994, and I will be your host for today's program. We will be sharing with you one Peace Corps volunteer's experience from abroad. With us today is John Southworth, who served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia from 1963 to 1964. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, Deborah. It's nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure. John, why don't you start by sharing with us what motivated you to join the Peace Corps? Well, you must think back that this period of time was when Peace Corps was just being organized. I had just graduated from undergraduate school and was in England for a year. And while there, was hearing about this new program called Peace Corps. And when I got back, I was thinking, do I go on to graduate school or do I investigate this new opportunity? And I investigated the new opportunity, uh, was then selected to train for going to Malaysia and a science program, science and math teaching. And if we look on the map, John, we're here in Hawaii. Right. And Malaysia is all the way west. That's right. And you were on the peninsula, is that right correct? Right on the peninsula, Malay Peninsula, and the northern part of that in the state of Kedah is where I was located. So why don't you share with us, when you first arrived in Malaysia, what were you feeling and thinking? Well, I was thinking that this is a, a new experience. Uh, I didn't know what was ahead of me. Um, it was an interesting period of time to, to be out in a foreign country like that, um, particularly being in a location where you're working in a culture you've never been in before. Uh, you're really learning what it means to be uh, working as a minority, for that matter. In my little town, I was the only uh, American in that particular town. So it was a very interesting place to be, an interesting time in history to be there, too. And had they had a volunteer before you, or were you the first one in that village? I was the first one in the bunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I came in, I remember the day they brought me uh, by Trishaw up to the school. Um, they cycled right by the school because they didn't think any uh, Caucasian would be going there because they thought I was British and going out to the British military base. So I was the very first American there. And who received you when you arrived in your village? <laughs> the Trishaw driver. <laughs> <laughs> a Trishaw is like a like jeep? A rickshaw. Or rickshaw. No, it's a okay. cycle rickshaw. And that was the taxi that I was supposed to take to the school, I found out. And so, no, I was the only one. I told them the school, I went there, and then the principal was there to meet me. But I was pretty much on my own. <laughs> and I guess you have some paintings you want to show us? Yeah, these are watercolors. Um, particularly, I think, maybe typical of the um, Malaysia in that particular time, particularly Western Malaya. This is the area where we were, and this uh, shows you a fishing village, uh, very typical of the architecture in a rural part of Malaysia. What are the people doing there? On the These are mostly fishermen working on their nets. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, this was a long time ago when this was done. Uh, how much of this remains in the culture? Because Malaysia has come a long ways and one of the most uh, developed parts of Southeast Asia. And yet, I imagine there are still villages similar to this. And what was their diet like? Was it primarily fish? or? Well, these people particularly would be. Uh -huh. And because it was a multicultural uh, country, it would vary considerably by the ethnic groups. The Malays, of course, being Muslims, wouldn't eat any pork. Um, but the Chinese, the Indians, some of the Indians wouldn't eat any meat. So that was one of the more interesting things about it, was to see the different cultures that we had in the country. There was a real diversity mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this other watercolor you have is? This is Malacca, which is down in the southern part of the Malay Peninsula and is a traditional cart of the old days. I would be interested to see if those are still around uh, today, but we did see them occasionally in those days. And would they use this to move their produce, or what would they use this for? And so probably it was that sort of thing, where you'd be working um, in the farmyards or the areas. Some of them were doing rice in the rural areas. And John, what was your work like while you were there? Well, I was <clears throat> trained to be a science teacher, science and math teacher in the secondary school. And so I was you know, working with second, well, secondary, upper secondary students, the equivalent of 10th, 11th grade here. And uh, science and math. 
And what was interesting at that time was the fact that I'd been in England the year before on a Rotary Foundation Fellowship. I didn't think about it at the time because I had no way of knowing I would be in Malaysia. But the educational system in Malaysia at that time was exactly the same as England because that's where it came from, it was a former colony. And uh, so that was one of the best preparations I had. It was a very different kind of education because they're, they have a very strict syllabus. Um, there wasn't as much freedom in the curriculum and being able to do things the way you wanted to. You had to know what the syllabus was and teach to that. And how did the students receive you? Did they um, find it strange to have an American teacher? or What was the... It wasn't strange. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting and I think an advantage in a place like Malaysia which did not have American military. There was no real American tradition there. There was only the British tradition. And they... Are, well, the American so you were a novelty. I was a novelty, and, and the main thing American were the movies. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we had to kind of live up or live down, was the American movies at that time. It was uh, an experience, I think, very significant to me, being a real minority. You know, I was like living in a zoo because I was the only white person there in my school and in the town, for that matter. Everybody took a real interest in checking mm -hmm, you out and mm -hmm. what you did. You had no privacy. Uh -huh. uh, I suppose some of the things you probably experienced in your Peace Corps experience would be similar. It's something you really learn to think about what you relate to and, uh, and see their interest in our country mm -hmm. uh, from their perspectives. And did you have some training? Did you learn a language? Or what language did you speak in primarily when you were there? Well. We trained in Malay because that was, of course, one of the things in countries where you were having a foreign language. I was teaching in a secondary school. My school was all in English. Mm -hmm. So the Malay training came to me more from the cultural standpoint because I actually ended up living with a Malay family and, and stayed with them. And so I would use the Malay with my family. Did you eat with them as well? Yes, I ate with them as well. And I didn't eat with them as well because being a Malay family during uh, Bulan Puasa, which is a fasting month, we weren't allowed to eat during the day. Mm -hmm. So we would um, get up at 3, or 3 a.m. in the morning and have a meal and then go back to sleep and then all day you couldn't eat until suhur, which is like breakfast, which is the end of the day when sun goes down. And this is a Muslim? Yes. Yeah, Muslim mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. What kind of foods did you eat? What was the well, preparation in the, the Malay diet I with the family, a lot of rice, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of curry. I often like to say the first month I didn't taste the food, I felt it as it was mm -hmm. so spicy. Mm -hmm. um, but I got used to it. I, I really enjoyed it. The giant Malaysian prawns we sometimes see, see in Hawaii here now uh, was one of my favorites. And, and the, the tropical fruits. It's interesting comparing Hawaii and coming here afterwards and seeing many of the things I saw in Malaysia. Uh, similar, a little bit more tropical. Some fruits are different, but a lot of them are the same that are here. Did you have any humorous experiences, John, while you were trying to uh, acculturate the living with a Malay family? Well, uh, the, the house that I was in uh, was rather open. It was a government housing unit, which was right near the railway station where I'd originally arrived. And um, I remember one day we had a, a cobra get loose and scribble around the back while I was uh, having a shower. <laughs> while you were in the shower, the cobra was in the yard? or they, they, <laughs> they said he was out there, and then they couldn't find him. And another one related to that while I was in school, the kids brought a um, cobra in a bottle, in a glass bottle. And I don't know if that was a threat to give them a good grade or what. <laughs> <laughs> and so. what was your, did you have any special students or what was your relationship like with the, the children you were tra teaching? I suppose that these were, as, you know, in the British system, you're rather more formal mm -hmm. in terms of your relationships. Uh, we did have a sports group that got started. Um, one significant person was Ahmad bin Saidin, who actually was the first person in the town to meet me and the reason and I was staying at the guest house and the reason that he did was he had just finished a year as an American field service exchange student in the United States so he really knew the American culture in a way he was a little bit homesick for the US 
And so he was the one that found the Malay family that I stayed with. He was the one that could relate to what's going on. And he had started this sports club. So that gave me an opportunity to run and do other things, sports with groups of, of the local. And what kind of sports did you do there? Mostly it was like track. Track. running and okay. things. We, did, we had baseball. We had a American Mingu Muhiba Goodwill Week where we played American baseball and uh, the locals and the um, Peace Corps volunteers that in that area came together for a tournament. And what language would you use to communicate? Would you primarily speak in English or did you use Malay or? Well, English most of the time. Mm -hmm. Malay because people that didn't speak English they would mostly speak Malay, whether they were Chinese, Indians, or the Malays. Mm -hmm. And what about, did, what did you wear? Did you have certain cultural? No, it's pretty much like this, uh -huh. um, comfortable wear, because it was in the tropics. Mm -hmm. um, usually something on your head when it's very sunny, because the sun is very intense. So you didn't wear like a sarong or anything? Well, like in, in the house, that's right. In the mm -hmm. house, similar to here, you never wore your shoes, and usually you put on a sarong to wear. In fact, I still wear, wear them today, <laughs> and I'm at home. And I see you brought some pictures for us to see. Mm -hmm. Are these drawings that you've done? Yes, these were uh, actually ones I did while I was in the country. And uh, it turns out my slides were, were lost uh, coming back. So these are some of my mementos of, of the country that uh, I still have. This is the capital, is it? or Kuala Lumpur, yes. Mm -hmm. That's the, a view of the government buildings in Moorish style that they were built in. It seems rather, it, it looks rather European. Is it? Well, that's the, you know, the culture and the, the history of, mm -hmm. of Malaysia had gone through uh, the, the Dutch and the English and, and other cultures there and so you do see quite an eclectic type of architecture in there. What was interesting while this building was where the government buildings were at that time and that was Malaya. Remember we're just in the time where they're becoming a separate country of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. They were building very modern buildings for the new parliaments and that would be the new government buildings. Were they still um, connected with England in terms of uh, power or was the was did they consider the queen one of their that was they were still in the commonwealth so the they commonwealth. had those okay. relationships but no it was very much an independence uh -huh. um, we were there in fact it was Malaya when we went Malaya group four was what I joined and um, while that first year we celebrated with them the Malaysia independence celebrations okay. and it was probably interesting to me in the fact that it was a, a very peaceful turnover. There was not a lot of antagonism toward the former colonial power. Um, the people, I think, found it interesting that the Americans were more approachable because we had a different lifestyle, we were less formal and lots of things. But um, it was not a situation where, in unfortunately parts of the world now, where you're going, a great violence and overthrow and that sort of thing. It was an evolution as the new nation of Malaysia came about. A smooth kind of transition. Right, yeah. right. I see you have another picture here. Is this the entryway to your town? <laughs> That's the railway station. The railway that station. That was my very first view of, uh, of the town as I arrived. And uh, then, uh, in fact, I didn't know it at the time, but I would t was to be living within 100 yards of that station because the government housing was just off to the side of there. And I see there's several languages on the sign that <laughs> brings welcome. What are the different languages the, there? They have the uh, Tamil, the Indian uh, language, and uh, Chinese, and the Jawi down there. That's the Malay script. Very, very indicative of that part of Malaysia where you had a, a multicultural experience. And, and that was certainly a highlight, I think, of being able to be and even though I lived with a Malay family, a Muslim family, I observed their, their traditions, they were liberal to the extent that they wanted me to get out and participate in the cultural experiences of all the other groups. So quite it's open. Very. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And here you have a picture. Is this the school where mm -hmm. you taught? Yeah, that's, that's the school. Uh, it's interesting. That uh, was a new wing over here versus the old traditional buildings, very typical of the schools about that time. There was a lot of, of building going on 
for schools, for health centers, and that was one reason why Peace Corps was called in. We were really not taking anybody's place, but we were filling in until they trained up their people to take over. So there was a real movement to forward ed education oh, yes. in the village, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this the particular day I remember because of the the flag being at half mast was the day after Kennedy had been assassinated. And how did that influence the villagers or your experience being there? It was, it's an unforgettable experience. I mean, particularly to be out of your country when something as catastrophic as that happens. I found it uh, very moving because whatever you felt about President Kennedy, uh, he was very much a hero in a lot of the foreign people's eyes, at least in Malaysia. And their feeling of loss, their expressions of sympathy were just overwhelming. It was as though I'd lost a family member. So it, it really was an interesting period of time to be there and to uh, realize, at least in that period of history, that the uh, president really did have a big influence in terms of how that country related to us. Was there any question with that going on that Peace Corps might withdraw from the country or um, because of that situation? Right. No. No. Okay, no. that wasn't an no. issue. It, it, because it wasn't really involving no. Malaysia. It wasn't. Right. Any, it wasn't their their problem. It wasn't any terrorism or anything like that. Right. It was our problem. Right. And 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 that wasn't. They hadn't been any cause of it. So it was just this period of kind of shock we all went through, mm -hmm. and and realizing that. And here you have a ceremony. What ritual is this? That's <laughs> this happening? is called Taipusan. Uh -huh. This is the Indian. That's again the, the multicultures. This particular one is the example where uh, the Indians that observe this particular activity show penance, and they they do this by putting uh, spears in their skin, and they walk around uh, doing penance, and uh, it's quite a sh shocking thing to see. But it's a uh, Hindu it's ritual, a Hindu ritual uh -huh. that they follow, and this was uh, the little temple that was out, a rural temple not far from where we were. Is that once a year? or Yes, yeah. it's once a year. Mm -hmm. And this was about the same time that we were um, in Hari, Hari Bulan Puasa, which is the fasting month. So this was taking place. The Malays were ending their month, and they were celebrating the end of fasting, and they had lots of parties and things like that. And then Chinese New Year's came up also not too far, and that's another big time for festivals and festives and feasts all the time. And John, you were saying how diverse it is there. It looks like we have another um, cultural tradition mm -hmm. here. This is the heritage, of Chinese heritage. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually comes with the... Uh, Ong Kong Si, the temple of the Ong family in Penang, which was near us. They had many Chinese in the uh, uh, urban areas, particularly. Did and you you visit some of the temples and oh yes, make, yeah, uh -huh. sit and enjoy them? I know this was the one that had the snakes, um, but I know there was another one, the Green Snake Temple. We would go to see in in um, Penang, and those mostly a, a Buddhist mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. And this is a, is that in a village or? This is actually in Ipoh, which is mm -hmm. one of the larger towns one of the, where the center of the tin industry was in Perak State. I was in, actually in the middle of a 600 mile bike trip, leaving my town and biking down through the peninsula and stopped here at Ipoh. This is the mosque and uh, was typical of uh, the location where on Fridays the uh, They'd sound the horn and they'd all go down to pray and have their services. And also then when they would end the fasting month, they would uh, join there in the mosque. And the, you said 600 mile bike trip. This was a, a vacation or? Well, this was actually in relation to my uh, finishing my service and turning in my bicycle. Uh -huh. was, uh, uh, at that time, it was interesting because Malaysia or Peace Corps was trying to live like the counterparts. And so they had given us bicycles so that we would be like our counterparts. Well, all of us in the schools were saying, well, you know, actually, if we're going to live like our counterparts, we should have cars because all of our fellow teachers had cars in those days. But we had bicycles, and they also, they were American bicycles. They shipped them all the way in. They were Schwinn bicycles, so they were really pushing American economy. So that was quite a, a sight for the students to see, and they'd always follow me each day when I would come to school or leave. But I took this chance to see more of the country 
taking a slower departure as I went down to Kuala Lumpur to return it. And how long did that take you to bike 600 oh, miles? I think it was a matter of about a, a week or so. Uh -oh. and we stopped at different places and had a chance actually to see some of the, the native culture there. In this particular case, here's a, a fishing village that's very typical around Kedah in the northern state and some of the uh, areas in the western part of the state along the seacoast. And there's a more professional view as one of my students from our school, the Malays, were very artistic and this is a particular one that was uh, drawn by one of the students and given to me. You had mentioned something about being in the tropics and the jungle. Is that a photo from one of the villages up there? Yes, this, this is a, a, an interesting chapter of, of my experience there, particularly because it gave me an opportunity to, to see their aboriginal peoples, the Orang Asli as they called them. Uh, these were people who were often deep in the jungles. Uh, some of them were very difficult to get to. This particular one was uh, fairly accessible, not too far from Ipo. And I visited there several times. Uh, the headman's son had been educator, was being educated at a, a mission school there. And so I was given an introduction and actually had a chance to spend some time in this village. It was very interesting. Then later I was able, thanks to a fellow volunteer in our group who was assigned with the medical unit with the Orang Asli, to fly into the jungles by helicopter and visit some very isolated villages. And how did that feel different from the village you were serving in as a teacher? Well, I think the main difference was that I was in a small town mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, it was definitely a village. It was very primitive kind of, of housing. Um, but I also found it very interesting in talking to the, the people of the Orang Asli. They were, they were very isolated and yet they had a very openness. They were hospitable. They had a curiosity about the outside world, even though in many ways they were very much cut off from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was very impressed by seeing, though it's primitive, it didn't mean they weren't sophisticated in some ways in their thinking. And they, they were very hospitable and very. welcoming. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Is that the helicopter you would take when <laughs> you would go to these villages? That was one of, you know, I'd spent this holiday basically traveling uh, with the medical unit uh, to visit testing in many cases. We actually had a, a contrast of coastal villages where they were testing for malaria, very high incidence of malaria because of the mosquito population. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was much nicer being up here in the central parts of the jungle when we flew in by helicopter. Again though, testing and helping them for whatever medical problems they had. Mm -hmm. But this was much more isolated. Um, what was your role when you would go up into the, um, you know, when they were testing for medical? Basically, at that time, I was just kind of accompanying or helping. I wasn't really on an official assignment. Supporting. Supporting, supporting you know, yeah. doing whatever we did. But it gave me an opportunity to see other parts of the country. John, I see you brought some um, artifacts for us to have a look at. What is this? Is this a gift from someone? <laughs> this, this is a gift, actually. It represents Indian culture, in a sense. It was... Um, it resulted from my uh, volunteering as a, you are talking about community groups, I was a um, member of the Boys Brigade uh, Officers Group. Boys Brigade is like the Boy Scouts, it started in England. And so I worked with Sungai Patani Company as they called it. Uh, interestingly, I was uh, actually a member of the Boys Brigade in uh, California when I grew up a very unusual thing because there aren't many boys brigades there so it was very interesting for me to be there and and uh, this was presented to me at the end of my time is this I, a machete or this is a Gurkha knife would they use that you see this no it's mostly no. ceremonial okay the the Gurkhas who are, who are known for their fighting abilities they might have used this in past times but it was more of an honorific thing uh -huh. and because the Gurkha camp was near there there were some of the people that were we had served I actually ended up starting a band for them while I was there. I'd been involved in some music, and so we had a drum and bugle corps mm -mm. in our town. So they were thanking you <laughs> yeah, for right. your contribution. Mm -hmm. And here you have, these are made out of, is that shell or? This is bone, no, the, bone. the kerbal or the water buffalo bone, mm -hmm. typical, I think, of Southeast Asia. And then the pewter, which was the made from the tin, which was in part of the 
country. How many people could afford this kind of utensil? Is that common or? Well, this would be like something that was nice, but oftentimes people could get them. It wasn't like it was really, really expensive, like all silver or something would be. And what are these little? Uh... Those are just models of the uh, Malay Chris. You see, this is the Chris. In fact, you so see ornamental. this was silver filigree. Uh -huh. And it's the same really as this, which is larger. Again, this is a model. The okay. Chris is a, a Malay, um, I guess, originally defense tool, but more of a cultural thing in their dances, they would use the Chris. Okay. What, John, how did this experience, you were living there, being a part of a family, uh, teaching, traveling, um, how did that experience influence you and what, what touched you in terms of when you completed your time there and you were coming back? Well, I think one of the things was, again, this experience of, of really being out of our country and seeing another place through the perspectives of somebody who was different <laughs> and, and being... Um, being like a curiosity, it was like being in a zoo a lot of the time. And I know when I came you here to You felt like Hawaii, you were a monkey or... Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. And, but you got used to it. Mm -hmm. You knew that they were just curious and you just accepted it. I think it had an effect when I came, actually it ended up coming to Hawaii. I, I was on the way back home and I got a letter when I was in the hospital with hepatitis to, um, in India to come to Hawaii to work in the training center. As so you, when you completed your Peace Corps service in Malaysia, you came back to Hawaii and you were invited to help with the training program mm -hmm. located in Hilo. In Hilo, right, uh -huh. right. They were just been going a few years there. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't, weren't going when I went. I trained in Northern Illinois University in the middle of winter, so I wanted to come and I came to Hilo and ended up staying here doing my graduate work in oceanography and living here. But it was, it was really interesting, I think, coming here Many people say how Hawaii seems so oriental, and in a way, I came seeing how the culture was really much more Western. But I also found it was difficult for me to judge people in terms of the racial differences, because I had lived that year where I just kind of forgot about it, and you got to judge people in terms of who they were, whether you liked them, you didn't like them, what their characteristics were, rather than the racial types. So you would learned how to connect on a much deeper mm -hmm. level. Well, John, we want to thank you for joining us with our program today. It's been very nice to be here. And please join us next time when we visit another country and bring the world home. Aloha.